Red Dice Diaries podcast, a rambling journey through the wonderful world of RPGs by a long-time GM and player. The music at the start of this podcast is Shinigami by Tarek, used under Creative Commons license. Okay, so in this episode of the podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit with my wife, Hannah, about Behind the Walls, an adventure that I've been working on with the very talented Glenn Seal from Monkey Blood Design, the author and creator of the Middlelands campaign setting. If you don't know what the Middlelands campaign setting is, it's based basically an OSR campaign setting, set in a sort of weird fantasy version of the United Kingdom. Obviously, this appeals to me because I'm from the United Kingdom, so it's great to have a bit of familiarity. But for my mind, it sort of it does for Britain and the UK what Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay did for Europe and Germany. Sort of taking all these familiar things, putting a bit of a fantasy spin on them, and then giving you the game juice as Glenn calls it in his book so that you've got plenty of ideas and things to run with to create your game. I've been running a campaign, the Rose of West Haven. We've just started like our second season or series, if you will, of that recently and that's going great. I was lucky enough after coming up with a few ideas for my game to get in touch with Glenn and suggest writing this adventure together. Glenn very helpfully suggested that he would take on the the layout, the cartography and the design for which he's won an any award and is extremely skilled in. I unfortunately am not and I would cover the writing. Now hopefully in a few weeks time to a month or so that will be being released as a soft cover book. The writing is now done, it's all sent off to Glenn. I've seen a lot of the maps and the sort of proofs that he's done for the, the various layouts, and they all look absolutely stunning. I can see why he won his award at the Ennies, and I was happy to be able to use some of the work-in-progress maps in the recent game session I ran for our Rose of West Haven game, and hopefully that will be up on my YouTube and my Twitch soon once I've actually edited it down. Now, I've talked a few times before about how an adventure is really just a, a basic framework for a story and to sort of hang events and what your player characters do on. And I've often said that uh, a skilled GM can take a fantasy campaign, a sci-fi, get a horror campaign, whatever. They can take modules for different games and you can take the basic sort of guts of the adventure out. You can tweak them, you can reskin them, which I'm a great fan of doing. And you can use them for your own campaign, even if it's an entirely different campaign setting. Now, my wife Hannah runs a Star Trek game using the Fate system. And she kindly tested out my Behind the Walls adventure recently, adapting it for her campaign. So taking it from a sort of fantasy middle agey sort of setting to the far future of the Federation and this is just we I'm going to ask her a few questions and we're going to find out a little bit about how she did that and how she thought it went so first of all love if you'd kindly sort of give us a, a bit of a summary of your Star Trek game in general like who the players are and who the characters are and what it sort of involves I've been running the Star Trek game for about a year now we've got uh three no we've had four regular players for that year but they've been different players um we've had people that have never done rpgs before that are just trekkies we've had people that have no idea about star trek apart from the jj abrams movies different people have gm'd at different times everybody has a character and a couple of b characters so that we can flesh out the crew. Now, you say you've had different people GMing at different times. Was that a conscious decision you made from the start, or did that just sort of come about organically? I started the game planning to run it for six stories, and then somebody else had a story they wanted to run, and then somebody else jumped in, and now it's become a regular thing where we basically all try and keep one story in the bag cool. for when nobody else has got one. 
just so happened that this particular week the GM that was intending to run the game didn't really feel like GMing and I fancy running your Middlelands adventure. Now that's that's a great example there of what these pre-gen modules are good for because Hannah had a session where it was fairly last minute she was going to run it and it could be quite difficult to just pull something out of thin air and just run with it. Now having a module even if you've you've got to change a lot of stuff, you've got to jiggle it about a bit, you've got to reskin it, it can sort of get you going in the right direction. And it means that even if you've got to make up like 50% of it, that's still 50% of it you don't have to do. You haven't got to do the whole thing. So did you find it useful sort of oh, having it as much, a basis? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about that you've all got different characters, you've got B characters. So is that a sort of troop style play where you rotate the characters? How do, do people choose their characters? How does that Generally, work? Generally... Everybody plays their A character for the adventure unless for some reason that character wouldn't logically be there. So, for example, um, when the captain wouldn't normally go on an away mission, he'll play a red shirt or the engineer, who there isn't an engineer that's a main player character at the moment. Okay. So, uh, because... The Starfleet Bridge, you've normally got about eight characters there and we've normally got about four players. There's other characters, other skill sets that you can call on instead of your own normal skill set. And now, with Star Trek, that does seem to work quite well because obviously everybody's very focused in a particular area and sometimes you want people with guns and everybody's playing science officers. It's a great way of representing a massive crew when you've only got a small number of players without yeah. having to go through like the logistics of everyone playing multiple characters at the same time. Now, to to bring it back to the adventure behind the walls that I've been working mm -hmm. on, in the in the sort of default version that you get in the book, obviously it's set in the middle and so it's suitable for any fantasy OSR game. And it involves a small village called Otterdale, where some ancient Goman, which is the equivalent of Romans in the Midlands, coins have been discovered in some old ruins of a fortress. There's a, a disease plaguing the town, and there's potentially something lurking in the ruins. And that leads to the adventurers exploring it, finding out a bit more of the history, what's going on. But it's all tied into the idea of sort of Hadrian's Wall and the ancient Goman history, that sort of thing. Now, how did you portray that in a, a science fiction setting, which is obviously in the future, it doesn't have the sort of big Earth background? Three words for you. Low-tech planet. So, so are you saying that you, you just like transplanted the whole thing to a low-tech planet? Pretty much. So... Um, there was no magic, it was science, but that's about it, to be honest. Now, obviously, we're, we're not going to go into too many details about the adventure. We don't want to spoil it for people who may be planning to buy it or planning to run it or even play in it. But... Obviously, as you've already mentioned, magic, that there is magic in fantasy campaigns, which, yeah, you can, you know, that, that whole thing about any advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic, but... So, in the Star Trek setting, a uh, hundred years ago, conveniently about the time that the Romans had abandoned the settlement okay. in your setting, a mm -hmm. hundred years ago, the Klingons offered... Uh, occupied several low-tech worlds. They used them for mining facilities and things. So I simply swapped out your Goman Fort for a Klingon mining facility. Okay, now I, I know from, from what I've heard of your game and obviously you're talking about it, that your players are playing sort of Federation members. Now, how did you solve that idea? Well, like, this is a fairly isolated village in my so, game. Uh, but how did you solve that thing where they could potentially call on the Federation, bring in loads of backup and just like steamroller over all the threats? So uh, their mission was to go and check out whether or not there'd been any cultural contamination from right. this previous Klingon occupation of this settlement. Mm -hmm. They knew that there had been a previous party that had gone there before on the same mission and that they needed to look for them. And just to explain, one of the, the things in the adventure is when the player characters get to this village, 
in the default adventure they find out that they're not the first people there there's actually been another adventuring party before them who came to investigate the goings on and have apparently mysteriously disappeared so it's quite cool that you've sort of worked that element in now the adventure has been designed to be fairly generic and have a number of ways that you can bring player characters into it because each GM's campaign is different even if it's set in a sort of fairly typical sort of fantasy genre every player character party is different now i would assume that goes sort of doubly so you know if it's an entirely different <laughs> genre so how did you link your sort of your particular characters into this adventure? So on their mission to this low tech planet, they all got disguised as the local aliens. Standard. Um, we have our Klingon security officer. She's really tough, but she's also brand new to the crew. We have a young Ferengi ensign, who's. Uh, on the verge of insubordination and I'm really looking forward to the next episode because the captain's running that and due to various things that happened in this story I'm thinking things are going to kick off with him. Um, we had the captain himself who is a Betazoid, previously the security officer and then the guy that was playing the captain had to retire from the game so the first officer the base side got promoted to captain and that captain is now an admiral who occasionally emails in little suggestions when they need to contact starfleet the final one who uh, played quite a hefty role in this particular session mm -hmm. is the trill science officer um the trill are a species with a symbiont in their belly if you've watched Deep Space Nine, this is old news to you. Otherwise, it's very long and complicated. But basically, they have a certain affinity for parasites, which allowed them a few extra clues within this game in the same way that if it had been a D&D &D group, you might have had a druid that had had certain affinities to what's going on in this game. Mm -hmm. So they all got in their disguises they beam down onto the planet and I was then able to use your encounter random encounter to get into the village chart that you've got in there uh, to get them there yeah and I mean this is this is just a, a fairly standard sort of series of random encounter tables where you, there's basically a, a column for each sort of rough area you know like outside the village inside the fortress etc and you you can just in a standard OSR game, sort of every now and then you, you roll a D6. If you get a 1, there's a random encounter. You roll on the table and that tells you what happens for anyone who's not familiar with those. Now, did you have to make any sort of massive changes to that to use them? Or did you sort of port it in pretty From much as it was? From point on, I used the adventure pretty much as it was written. I didn't use everything that's in there because my player group are plot terriers and they instantly jumped on what was going on. Um, I believe I shouted down to you at about 40 minutes into the game, plot busted by the young Ferengi. Um, but they still very much enjoyed going and finishing off that story, even though they worked out what was going on quite quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in the game I, I ran recently myself, uh, so I could say different groups, it's going to work differently. I mean, the adventure itself has been designed to sort of work with as many groups as possible. The the group I'm running for, they're all a, a group of, like, church-sponsored, like, monster hunters, basically. So their sort of, like, ultimate solution to anything they don't understand is to, like, declare it a demon and try and, like, purge it with fire. So That was Starfleet's solution as well. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's pretty much... That's pretty much the, my, my player character solution to like anything. Like, get as much oil as we can, like cover it inside oil and then set it on fire, which has worked okay so far. But we're only like two sessions in. But again, they all seem to enjoy it, and obviously that's what it's about. So, do you have any other sort of high points of the session, like bits that you really enjoyed, or bits that you think worked particularly well in the adventure? So something that happens a lot with pre-written adventures is it gives the GM a lot of time to look at the characters and character development 
because they've not got to worry about making that little story that you're going to play just this session. You can push a lot more of what's going on with the whole group. As I say, we have this new Klingon security officer and the young Ferengi officer. The two of them were at loggerheads for a lot of the episode. Um, she'd take offence at something he'd said, he'd do something stupid, and then it all pretty much came to a head during the final combat when he disobeyed a direct order from the captain. Okay. Everybody survived in the end. If you don't mind me asking, what was, was the order that he disobeyed? Um, the captain basically... Uh, I don't want to give too much away. Okay. But there were enemies on all sides. The captain basically said, you and you go that way, deal with this. Me and my science officer are going this way to deal with that. Okay. And uh, young Rezum Ferengi, a uh, recent graduate from the academy and general uh, insubordinate who has been good friends with the captain before he became captain and almost sort of resents the new role that the captain has had to take to give instruction to him to... Oh, so he's gone he, from being his friend to being his boss, basically. That That's what's been going on, yeah. Um, he's disobeyed that order directly and used the weapon he had on the enemy that the captain had intended to face off with the science officer which left the group as a whole in a slightly weaker position um, this did however give the Klingon officer a fantastic chance to show off her battle skills and save the party which is always really nice for a new character to be able to do to establish that she has saved everybody's lives at some point. It, you know, it helps bond a character into the group. Um, now, uh, anyone who's listened to my podcast or read my blog will know that one of the, the things I really enjoy in role-playing games is when the, the player characters do something I've not been expecting because it sort of keeps me on my toes and it makes it interesting for me now that there are a few little bits and pieces like that in my game like we we had um one of the sort of like the knights of this this church sponsored monster hunter group when they realized that um a lot of people were getting sick in the village and particularly there was this there was this young woman who was sick he randomly in his equipment had bought like a load of bulbs of garlic just because he had like money to spend, and he was like, I don't know what to spend. I know we're monster hunters, maybe we'll come across some vampires. I'll buy some garlic. Bought some garlic, and he said, like, oh, out of character, I know that garlic's quite good as like a sort of antifungal, antiseptic sort of thing. You know, it's it's got quite a lot of health giving properties. Is it? But I don't, I don't want to take the piss too much. Like, would I know that in character? And I said, well, make a roll. If you get this, you know it. If you get that, you don't. He got the roll, and they ended up basically making like a, a sort of garlic soup for this woman and sort of like nursing her back to health. And that led to them sort of saying, oh, well, we know that like in, in England, like you can get like wild garlic and stuff like that. Can we like forage in the area and like look for some wild garlic? And that led to them sort of like almost getting like the villagers to start sorting themselves out by like saying, like, oh, look, we've cured this woman with this garlic soup. You know, like, Get out there, get as much of this wild garlic as you can. She'll like help you make this soup. And that was something that's like not in the adventure I wasn't expecting, but I really loved because it was like player ingenuity. Did you have any like cool moments like that when you were running it for your group? So again, I don't want to give too much away about what goes on in this uh, particular story. But at the end of the story, our Federation crew have managed to get themselves beamed back up to their ship, uh, having nearly been killed by the Gribbly thing. And we're left with the ethical decision of whether or not they should eradicate this gribbly thing. Um, whether or not it was a native species to the planet. Whether or not it was uh, breaking the Prime Directive to destroy this creature. Um, now, now for any of the, the listeners, bizarre though it may seem, who aren't so entirely au okay with Star Trek etc. And I'll keep <laughs> familiar with it. What's the Prime Directive? Well, the Prime Directive is very, very complicated. I believe it's over 50 pages. All right, just give us the clip notes version. 
<laughs> so one of the things in the Prime Directive is that you're not supposed to interfere with primitive species. Okay. Uh, primitive being anyone who's not capable of warp travel. So we in the 21st century are a primitive species according to Star Trek standards. Okay. As would be the people of a D&D world. The other entity involved in this particular game uh, was within the context of my story, Klingon, and therefore they could call it an invasive species and thus eventually decided that it was best for the population to eradicate it. Because another part of the Prime Directive says that if they see a primitive world that's going to be destroyed by something that they simply don't have the technology to deal with yet they have to intervene to try and stop that. So, for example, Starfleet redirects asteroids from primitive worlds, or when they can, they'll surreptitiously drop off cures for plagues. In a similar way, they eventually decided that they just needed to send like a whole load of people down there with flamethrowers. Uh, yeah, the, the, the old um, the fiery purge thing that never fails. Well, certainly not according to my player characters, anyway. Their entire crew just got the day with flamethrowers walking through caves. Okay, so obviously you were running this, this adventure in a different genre to, to what people would typically be running it into. Do you have any sort of tips in general for people who are planning to adapt adventures to like different genres yeah um look at the story and then make it your own this story as you've written it is quite a serious story it's quite grim and nasty and um scary in places uh but it's also fairly clever story it it's not gonna tax any of the like really intellectual players but it's still very fun to run through the way i tend to run stories i always tell you i like a big slice of cheese so i've taken what i needed from there and then added in what needed to make it my own version and i've having done this with your your story i'll be going through some of those books i've got up behind you of pre-written adventures and seeing what else I can pillage for Star Trek. Now, one of the things that I feature in this adventure is a drop chart. If you don't know what a drop chart is, it's basically a small picture. You take a handful of D6s or whatever dice you prefer, drop them on the chart, and where the dice lands, that gives you an effect or it tells you something's you can use them for like random encounters, random treasure tables, stuff like that. Now, in the, the sort of valley that houses Otterdale in this adventure, it's shrouded in a sort of semi-permanent mist. There's lots of moulds and fungus growing everywhere. Now, fungus has been featured in the Middlelands campaign book. And there's a few cool things about like hallucinogenic mushrooms and stuff like that. So I thought it'd be cool, since I'm a big fan of drop charts, to do a mushroom drop chart so that when the players go, like, oh, I'm going to pick some of these mushrooms for rations or whatever, you can drop a few D6 on this chart and it tells you how many rations they count as and if there's any other effects like them being poisonous, like them being hallucinogenic, stuff like that. Now, I know you said you particularly liked that level that you're working off my my sort of little one that I've done. I've seen the one that Glenn's sort of funking up for it and that looks absolutely brilliant. Did you did you actually get a chance to use it or? I didn't really. Uh, there were a couple of occasions where they came into close contact with various fungi, but my player group, being well trained Starfleet officers with an incredibly intelligent science officer with them, did not touch that stuff. <laughs> Uh, the science officer herself, as I said, being Trill, had um, several reactions to various fungi around the place, simply because that's something that happens to Trill, um, which, again, gave them a good lead into the story, which you could find other ways to do that with other player groups. There's always going to be that one character that one player that's like the plot terrier that will 
find whatever it is that they need or maybe you want to find that player that doesn't do much very often and put something in there that's definitely pointed in their direction yeah absolutely so i think that pretty much covers all that we need to talk about here so thanks to my wife hannah for talking to us a bit about your game and how you ran this adventure this adventure is behind the walls written by myself john lodge with all the cartography the layout the graphics etc being done by the fantastically talented glenn seal of monkey blood design uh, producer of the Midlands campaign setting. Hopefully that'll be coming out in soft cover within the next sort of few weeks to a month. And hopefully if you're interested, you'll go out, give it a look, maybe even purchase a copy for yourself. So thanks very much for listening. So from me and Hannah, take care. Thanks for listening. So that's it for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions for things you'd like to see in the podcast in future, please either email them to reddicediaries at gmail.com or drop me a voicemail at Anchor. Until I see you next time, whenever you're playing, take care and enjoy yourselves. <laughs>